Earnings season unofficially kicks off on Friday morning, this time with all four of the big money center banks, Citigroup, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. So now I want to get you ready for this initial earnings blitz because the banks can set the tone for the entire earnings season itself because they touch on so many parts of the economy. Last year, most of the big money centers came out of the regional banking crisis smelling like roses. These were the safest places to deposit your money in a world where we are getting actual bank runs. J.P. Morgan finished the year up 27 percent. Wells Fargo rallied 19 percent. Citigroup jumped 14 percent. It was only Bank of America that did poorly, up just 1.7 percent, because it had a large balance of unrealized losses from its bond investments, which is one of the things that brought down Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic. But that happened because the Fed tightened aggressively. There were absolutely no solvency issues at Bank of America. And now, well, that long rates have been coming down for months. It's no longer a problem, maybe an opportunity. After last year's moves, though, their valuations are all over the place. I like to look at the price of tangible book value for banks, meaning what the institution would be worth if you liquidated the whole thing overnight, which I know is not going to happen, but it's a good apples to apples way to look. J.P. Morgan trades at more than two times book value, which is pretty expensive. They deserve a premium, but that's getting up there. Bank of America and Wells Fargo trade at 1.4, 1.3 times book value, respectively. City trades at just 0. 0.6 times book value, making it the cheapest by a wide margin, although one could argue that there's something very wrong about anything that cheap. Raise his eyebrows. From a different perspective, they all sell for 9 to 11 times this year's earnings estimates. By the way, that is historically low. What about the narrative? J.P. Morgan remains very well liked, but not quite beloved. Deutsche Bank just upgraded the stock from hold to buy yesterday. However, I don't see many analysts scrambling the name at a top pick for 2024 or anything. I think J.P. Morgan's a real good stock that can grind higher, uh, you'd say, over time. Kind of, it's kind of like the Cleveland, Cleveland Browns, you know? Just, but maybe not one that can scream higher at any given point in time. How about Bank of America? Now, for a while, this was widely considered the second best money center. But last year, those concerns about the bond portfolio hijacked the entire narrative. At this point, Bank of America has become somewhat about what we call a show me story. They need to put up a few solid quarters in a row so that Wall Street can get excited about the story again. I think there's just a lot to like here. Excellent digital banking platform, attractive dividend, underappreciated investment banking franchise, very good management. But it remains unloved for the moment. For me, the most surprising thing is all the love we're seeing for Citigroup which has rallied roughly 39% from its multi-year lows in October. doesn't hurt that the company announced a major restructuring effort in September. Citi had already started abandoning many of their far-flung international businesses, but in September they said they'd eliminate certain management layers and generally cut a number of jobs. By now, they've enacted multiple rounds of layoffs, so Wall Street's excited that the cost cuts will finally let Citi deliver some real earnings. I don't know. Will there be growth from that? Questionable. According to the analysts, this is the only major bank that's expected to grow earnings in 2024, though, and that's up 5.2%. The street figures everybody else will experience low to mid-single-digit declines. Wow. I hope Citi can make a comeback, but let's just say I'll believe it when I see it. I'm much more excited about the very real turn at Wells Fargo, which we own for the Travel Trust. Just this week, the stock caught not one but two separate downgrades. Ugh. From buy to hold. You know what? I couldn't disagree with them more. The new management team at Wells remains maniacally focused on cutting costs and improving their technology. The dividend buyback also get better as we get further away from the company's problematic past, and the regulators give them more leeway. Frankly, I like that Wells Fargo is somewhat out of favor here. That's what gives you an opportunity. Charlie Sharp, CEO, is on a mission to cut costs and boost revenue. He will succeed. So with that in mind, what will we be watching for when they report on Friday? With the banks, the headline sales and earnings numbers only matter so much. The true key metrics here are net interest income, NII, and net interest margin, NIM, both of which show you how their core banking business is doing, what they make from borrowing your deposits and then lending that money at a higher rate. Long rates have come down dramatically, and I want to know what management thinks about high-changing uh, interest rates and how they will impact their uh, bottom line. we got to know who does best in a lowering rate environment. Okay. Second, we need some color on the state of both consumers and corporate credit. That's whether there's deadbeats or whether people are doing okay. Many banks took large positions for credit losses during the pandemic. Then in 2022, when the Fed started tightening, they did it again. But the actual losses didn't happen. So last year, the banks reversed those credit charges, giving them a very nice earnings boost. If credit quality remains robust, we could see more charge reversals, meaning the earnings estimates for 2024 might actually be too low. If they make more negative comments about credit quality, though, the stocks are going to get hurt. They may take the whole market down with them. Third, I'll be listening for any other commentary about the financial health of the consumer. The incredibly resilient levels of consumer spending, thanks to the incredibly resilient labor market, has allowed the economy to stay much stronger than expected, even as the Fed's ruthlessly raised interest rates for the past couple of years. 
Most of these big banks are large credit card issuers, so they have great color and consumer spending habits. They can also tell us about deposit balances, loan demand, both important metrics, of course, spending. I'll be watching this stuff closely because it's a great way to take the pulse of the consumer. Finally, although it's a bigger deal for outfits like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, uh, both of which report early next Tuesday, I'll be listening for commentary on the Money Center investment banking operations. There's a lot of optimism about a continued recovery for the capital markets business this year, both thanks to a resurgent IPO market and also, geez, just billions of dollars in bond issuance, something that's almost a given with interest rates coming down. We've also seen a pickup in M&A, which is great for investment bankers. The advisory fees they get on these deals are phenomenal. An investment banking comeback could allow the financials to give us some excellent performance this year. So let me give you the bottom line about the banks. If you believe, as I do, that interest rates have peaked and that our economy is almost certainly in for a soft landing, thank you, Jay Powell, then the banks should be worth owning right now. But let's see what happens when the four big money centers report on Friday. Why don't we take some calls? Why don't we start with Tim in Georgia? Tim. Hey, Jim. Thank you for taking my call. Oh, my pleasure, Tim. What's going on? Great. So uh, I've been invested in SoFi for a couple uh, years now, and I have a 650 share average. Uh, my overall invest, my investment strategy is pretty simple. Just look for good companies with significant growth potential, excellent CEOs, and stay long. So my question with SoFi is relating to valuation. With gap, prof with gap profitability and earnings right around the corner, how do you think the market will valuate SoFi as a well, bank or a well, fintech, and what would your strategy be in 2024? Excellent concerns, and congratulations on having such a good basis on SoFi. I think that we're going to stop thinking of this. This will be the year where we stop thinking about just on how many people they sign up and start thinking about how much money they're making. And you're absolutely right. Anthony Noto was a fantastic CEO. I think at $8, this is one of the cheapest banking stocks not fintech. Those days are behind it. How about Charlie in Pennsylvania? Charlie. Jim, it's an honor to be on your show. You know, uh, it seems like there's ubiquitous sentiment out there right now uh, for the market to broaden out. And I think about adding to a position I've had for years, uh, it seems to be fitting niches that are quite popular right now, small company financial, and it's a dividend aristocrat. I'm thinking about a little regional bank here, community bank systems. Oh, man, that is real. It's like Jim on Canal. Holy cow. I like your cho choice. It's going to do very well in a lowering uh, rate environment, and it's very inexpensive. Good call. Good call, my friend. Now, if you believe, as I do, that interest rates have peaked, then the bank should be worth owning right now. But let's see what happens when the big four money centers report this Friday. Much more mad money ahead, including my J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference exclusive with Beckton Dickinson. How is the med tech company using AI to streamline its business? I'm getting the latest from the CEO. Then I have one key takeaway from being out in San Francisco with some of the world's largest healthcare CEOs. I'll reveal what I learned and how it could impact your investing thesis in the space. And all your calls rapid fire in tonight's edition of The Lightning Round. So stay with Kramer. 